Now, when God created the earth the first time, this was before Satan's attempt at a coup, the creation was beautiful and it was perfect. There was no pain and there was no agony. But Satan put into motion the start of pain and agony. Both physical and emotional pain are a part of his plan. He wants to see everyone as miserable as he is. And more than that, he wants to destroy everyone. You know, when we feel pain and agony, misery, deep down, we are being influenced by the king of this world. Now, pain has been inflicted upon man since the beginning of man because of man's sins. Let's look at this in Genesis 3 and verse 16. Genesis 3 and verse 16. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. So we see the introduction of pain for the human race. Right from birth, the mother is in great pain. And by extension, the child. And so we see that Satan, throughout the Bible, has been trying his hardest to do whatever he can to maximize this pain. Now, the pain in childbirth wasn't limited to just Eve, but to all women. And so we see the entrance of sin into the world because that is what happened here with Eve, she took of the apple and gave it to Adam. And they both sinned by eating from the tree of knowledge and evil. Let's look at Revelation 12 and verse 9. Revelation 12 and verse 9 says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The great deceiver. It started with Adam and Eve. He tricked them into believing that taking of the wrong tree would be good for them, that they would have knowledge, and of course they came to have knowledge, but the wrong type knowledge. And so this deception, Satan continues to spew into this world. He brings about the desires for war, for all kinds of terrible things that people do to each other, and all for the sake of trying to gain a little wealth, a little money, a little prestige, whatever their heart might desire. But it just brings about suffering, pain and misery, and even death. And all these things entered into this world, not only because of Satan, but Adam and Eve's decision to follow after him. And most men continue, most people, continue to disregard God's way of life, his laws. And so suffering continues on. Now, to a large degree, individual suffering results from individual wrong. Wrong choices, mostly. And many times our personal sufferings are the result of the wrong choices that we have made, the wrong things that, wrong things that we have said or done. 
You know, every time we decide to sin, we, like Adam and Eve, take of that tree of knowledge of good and evil. We decide what we want to do. But every time we overcome sin with the help of the Holy Spirit, we're willing to partake of the tree of life. You know, Adam and Eve failed in this. But we are called upon to do better, to succeed. We're commanded to choose life, to eat freely and continuously from the tree of life, and by extension, reap its benefits, both now and, of course, in the future. If we will turn to 2 Timothy 3, in verse, starting in verse 10. We see a, another type of suffering mentioned by Paul here. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 10. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, and perseverance, persecutions and afflictions which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of them, knowing from whom you have learned them. You now, sometimes in life, we also suffer. And it's not because God doesn't care about us. Maybe it's not because we did something to deserve it. Sometimes we have to suffer to go through hardship, to learn to learn, lean and trust in God, like Paul here. He mentions three cities in which he had severe persecutions. And Paul states that if we truly want to live with Christ leading in our lives, then we too will suffer. But this suffering, brethren, is it's just temporary. It's just a part of this life. If you will turn to Romans 8 and verse 18, and we'll read to verse 31. Romans 8 and verse 18. Here's Paul once again. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Verse 23. Not only that, but we also have the first fruit of the Spirit, even as we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit knows also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because it makes intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among, among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. 
And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Brethren, I hope that we each understand what Paul is saying here. That we take this scripture to heart. He breaks it down pretty simply. We will suffer. And we know we will suffer. We know that things in our lives will be hard. And that they will get harder as Satan sees his time growing shorter. But we wait. We wait with longing and hope for the return of God. To reveal his plan in all creation through us. It says that the earth even groans in anticipation. If you look at what we are doing to this planet, it's, it's utter madness. We're destroying it one step at a time. And since we know that we are to wait in hope, and hopefully we do wait with hope, with patience, praying in all things with faith, asking the Spirit helps to intercede for us, where it is the will of God. And if we believe these things, then we can have confidence. We can have faith that God works out all things for our good even if it doesn't seem that way until a later time. Because you see, we've been predestined. We've been called. We've been justified. And even glorified in God's eyes. Not to mean that we are glorified at this present time, but in God's eyes, he sees us as being God beings already. So how can anything stand in our way if we truly understand and take to heart the scripture? Now, in the kingdom, we see in Isaiah 25, verse 7 to 9, where it says, And he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. No more tears. No more sadness. No more pain. There will be peace for all people. Now, people will have to learn how to do this, but it will be accomplished. And we see also that there will be more pain and agony just before the 100-year period, where people once again see once and for all that Satan's way is just not worth it. Now, in our booklet, From Now Until Forever, in chapter 10, It gives you, if you will, a thousand foot view of the conditions that will be in God's millennium. Some of the sections in this chapter are as follows. Saints will rule the earth, spiritual restoration, physical restoration, wild animals become peaceful, wars will cease, cities will be rebuilt, no more sickness, No more food shortages. Waste places will become fertile. Jerusalem, the center of worship. A pure language. English. Just kidding. We don't know. Conversions of the Gentiles. Increase of Christ's government. You know, in each of these sections is backed up by Scripture. Proving and showing God's desire 
for all mankind, and that it's to be without pain, without agony, living in peace and harmony. And for once, being able to do things in a way that actually makes sense. And finally, to roll that into eternity with many, many God beings. So let's remember, brethren, any pain, any agony, any annoyances, they're not the end game. Just character building blocks. You know, they are God's will for us to endure so that we can have a bright future so that we can help all of mankind to have a future without pain and agony. Thank you.